Morning, everybody. How are you? Oh, it's been a little crazy. Got so much going on. I'm trying to like pull it all together and it's just crazy. <laughs> okay. That's all I can tell you is it's really, really crazy. We've got so much going on in the next few months and I don't know, this is too much. I've got approximately $10,000 worth of fabric coming in somewhere around there in the next two, possibly three weeks. And I'm just trying to correlate it all. It's probably close to 100, 150 volts. Um, and I have all my next three or four months worth of fabric already ordered. And we are going to um what else oh my goodness i can't even think i'm telling you it's just crazy um we are handy a handy quilter ruler of the month store so that's super exciting it's a six month program and um if you join you that month I don't charge for classes. It's going to be the fourth Saturday of the month um, at 10 a.m. And I'm going to give you 10% off when you come in on any of other rulers. And it's really cool. It gives you the option. It's called Boundless Borders this time, uh, this go around. Um, it's going to give you a very reasonably priced option to pick up a new ruler each month, give you 30 days to play with that ruler um, before you're ready for another one. And the nice thing is, it, I know some of the rulers, they just don't look like they'd be useful. Honest to God. I mean, let's look at them. Some rulers you can tell when you look at that are like, oh, cool, I can't wait to use it. Others, you're just looking at it and you scratch your head. Well, being part of the ruler of the month club, means that I'm gonna show you all the different ways you can use the rulers. I'm a big lover of rulers. I mean, really, if I could spend all day doing ruler work, I would. But there's two different types of rulers. There's the rulers that are just a channel that you just follow and it only does one thing. Not, I have very few of those rulers. There's certain rulers that I do because I can't physically do the work on my own. It just doesn't work. I'm one of those people that can't walk down the street and chew gum at the same time without falling flat on my face, which means I can't use my head, my hands and my feet all at the same time. It just doesn't work. But then there's other rulers that you are really only limited by your imagination. There's so many things that you can do with them. Um, that's what I get excited about and I can't wait to show you. It's just, you gotta be patient because I'm literally stretched to the max at trying to get everything going. Um, between COVID and now non-COVID, but we're still a little bit of COVID, it's just trying to find the new norm and it's changing way too much too fast. But, okay, let's get back to what we're here for. It is make the cut. So we're on, working on our second row. And you can see my first row right here. Um, these were the blocks that we did last week, which is 11 and 12. So we're working on 13 and 14. And I have them laid out. And I've already done a little bit of work just to help kind of move it along. If you have any questions about anything that I do in these, in these videos, just send me a message, type a comment, and I promise I will answer your messages. All right, so let's get started. Woohoo! On both of these blocks, I pretty much used a scant quarter of an inch, um, only because we've got an awful lot of piecing in these blocks, a lot of little pieces. So you can see this, I'm assuming. This is block 13. Okay, and we've got a little square in the center with kind of like a, a um, it's kind of like a um, reverse log cabin. I'm kind of on that idea. So I've got the block in the center with the two side sashes. 
two side pieces and I've only put this piece on top, I mean on the bottom. So now I'm just gonna take the top, And again, we're using a scant quarter of an inch. If you are lucky enough to have an extension table and you have a grid glide, it is a wonderful, wonderful thing. It's really gonna help you stay straight um, and get your seams a little bit better, um, a little bit better as far as being more consistent because I'm just following the line. So there is a dotted line all the way down here. I actually, because of in this blocks, I'm using a scant quarter of an inch. So we have, I have moved it slightly, my mat over a line. So it's not completely centered so that I can follow the quarter of an inch mark as my scant quarter of an inch. And the nice thing about the mats is you can adjust them and move them as much as you want. <laughs> if they get not, not uh, if they get unsticky, I don't think that's a technical term, but you get my idea. All you have to do is wipe the back of this with a um, unscented baby wipe, let it dry and lay it back down. I really love them. Okay, I'm just gonna iron my seam and I'll be right back. And there we are. Now we've got to put our two sides. And again, I'm just using a scant quarter of an inch. It's, I'd rather use a scant quarter of an inch when there are this many seams in such a small block because then you can square it up later on and make sure most of your blocks or if not all of your blocks are the same size. But if you use the full quarter of an inch, it's not gonna give you any wiggle room. Using all of these white on whites and neutrals, let me tell you, it's been difficult trying to make sure I've got the right, right side of the fabric. And I definitely recommend if you have a brother or a baby lock, that you backstitch both at the front and I mean at the, the beginning and at the end because if not, by the time you get this entire quilt together, if you'll have stitches that will not, that will come undone. I can't say, you know, on the other machines, like I think a FAF automatically does a lock stitch. Um, but I've owned Brothers and Baby Locks most of, most of the time. And for some reason, they do not give you um, a tight first stitch. So this is the top row. I've already done the bottom row, okay? Which is just two blocks um, each end of this long one. And I'm gonna now stitch the top one. These seams here, I've got going out on both sides with these little seams here going in. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna make sure, I'm always looking, for, looking ahead, looking at the next part that I have to do to make sure that I can nest my seams and get them all lined up. I really didn't pin much in this block at all. Um, the only time I normally pin is when I'm doing seams. Like I will pin for the top and the bottom. Just so that I can make sure to line up these seams here.
goodness, trying to, I love Toscana, but sometimes looking at the Toscana, trying, especially on the white, trying to figure out which side is the right side is pretty difficult. Move this one up and we'll get ready for that. Okay, just gonna iron the seams and I'll be right back. Can't wait till I can get this studio set up in its rightful place. Um, it's very difficult right now, trying to make sure the classroom is ready for class and get this stuff all straightened out. It's not fun. So I'm looking forward to being able to put this um, whole entire studio where it belongs and not have to worry about it. Because I have a feeling um, virtual classes are here to stay. Okay. So, I know it's probably hard for you to tell, but we've got this bottom seam going this way and we've got this top seam going that way. And that will give you the option to what we call nest our seams. And this is when I will, will pin. So, I start on one side and angle it into the other side. I'm just gonna be sewing from here down. So my pin is on an angle like this so that I can sew and put my stop at my needle down right at the seam before I pull this pin out. Oftentimes just the action of pulling the pin out is enough to throw off your seam. That was probably one of the most frustrating lessons I've ever learned in quilting. And that is lining up your seams. No matter how much in the beginning you try and you think you've got it and then voila. You, it's kind of like the, the, the surprise in the box that you don't want because once you push your seat and go to iron it over, it's not where it's supposed to be. I used to hate that. I used to dread having to iron and flip because I never knew. Oh, look at that. I never knew when I lifted that up if my seams were going to line up. So before I iron this, I'm just going to go to the next one and do the same thing. And then this first block, 13, is done with the exception of ironing. And, um, I won't sew it onto the row today because I want to make sure it's all squared up, but you'll see it on the row uh, next week. I do recommend you sew these onto your row um, when you get them done so that you don't lose it, misplace it, or you know exactly where you are. Because let's face it, we're talking about 50 weeks. That's a lot of pieces to keep track of. And it's a long time. Okay. If you watch this video later on after I'm done today, do me a favor and post a comment or give me a thumbs up or something to let me know that the audio and the video is still good quality. I'm working on, besides waiting for a couple of more lights to come in, um, on setting up my boom microphone and testing that up, out, not up, <laughs> testing that out to see how that will work for these videos. But um, I'm trying to kind of 
I don't want to have too many Y's in here as far as in the way, because it is a classroom. But once I get it set up in the spot where it's not going to move too much, we'll be all set. There you go. Iron it real quick. There is block 13. Okay, now block 14 <laughs> is a lot, not a lot, lot, but it's a lot of little pieces. All right. So hopefully you can see that. Disregard the colors because that's for the other quilt. To get the idea. So we've got four half square triangles and the triangles and the center. And this is done very traditionally with a little bit of an untraditional method, as far as I'm concerned, the way I do it. Okay. I know it's kind of hard to tell, but I have two fabrics right side together. Normally you would put a line, draw a line down half of the center of the diagonal. And then you would stitch a quarter of an inch on both sides of the line and then cut on the line. Well, here is another nifty thing about having the grid guide. I can, I also use the quarter inch foot with the guide. So if I put my guide right on the corner and make sure this corner down here is following the line all the way up and then turn, and do the same exact thing on the other side, guess what? I know it's hard to tell, but hopefully you can see that. I've stitched a quarter of an inch on both sides of the center and all I'm gonna do is cut it down the center. And no, I'm not using a rotary cutter. I mean, this is quick and easy. I'm pretty sure that you can eyeball the center and cut to give yourself roughly a quarter of an inch on both sides. Not All right, here we go. This is a fairly easy block. Again, we're gonna do a scant quarter of an inch and I'm gonna take it one row at a time. Okay. Hopefully you can see that. So we've got these three little pieces by sewing our half square triangle together with this square and then we're gonna sew it to this and do the same thing on this side. And then it should be the same height if you do scant quarter of an inch to connect to this middle block. I find by having my block out on the table all the time so I can see it, um, it makes piecing go a little bit more accurately. Um, don't get me wrong, I have sewed the wrong piece to the wrong part and had to rip it out and start again, but I try to cut that down as much as possible. I didn't quite go to the end. Fabric. I 
Okay, and guess what I did? I told you I was gonna do it last week. I had one of these at my desk that I love and I put it up at the register when I'm not using it and I just kept forgetting to bring it back. This is that chain piecing blade. So there's an old rotary blade in there um, that I didn't throw out. It's not necessarily strong enough and sharp enough for fabric, but it's good enough for thread. And then when I'm chain piecing, whoop, all I got to do is cut the thread. Okay. Uh, so this one goes this way. This one goes this way. I'm going to iron these and then I'm going to do the same thing with the top part. these two. How is everybody? Yesterday was a really nice day here in Florida, but I didn't get to enjoy it too much. It was crazy. And today feels like it's going to be uh, a crazy day too. I don't know why, but I think it is, but it's raining. So at least I don't feel so bad about not being outside. All right. I've already done it again on this one and I'm just going up. Hey, I like my toys. I'm just going to iron these seams and I'm a little bit ready for the next part. It's a really not difficult part. Um, as long as you just cut fairly accurately and you just take your time. I wanted to do this quote along because I think some people are intimidated by something this big. And I wanted to be able to break it down for you so that it takes the, I don't know, scare out of it. Okay, let me switch cameras back again. So now we're going to sew these side pieces on. And I do this all four because I find that if you do the same thing, over and over, you're less likely to mess it up. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. See, everybody can mess up. I wanted to change and not cut my thread. If you do not have a map, okay, and you want to know an easy and affordable way to work with some sort of a guide to do a scant quarter of an inch or quarter of an inch, this is my recommendation because I've taught a lot of different people from all walks of life and if different ages, and not everybody is in the same. Um, parts of the country. Some people are driving over an hour to a quilt store and they just don't have the same options as everybody does. Get post-its. You know, little post-its, if you can find the little ones that are like, I don't know, an inch and a half by an inch and a half or an inch and a half by two inches and stick them. Take your ruler, and of course I don't have one option right now. Measure 
even if it's just, if you wanna do a quarter of an inch, measure from the needle out to your quarter of an inch line. And tape with masking tape, cause that won't, uh, or paint is tape that won't affect your machine. Tape a big stack of post-it notes right here. And then that can be, um, or just before, you know, probably closer down to about, right about like here so that you have something to start with and then move up before it gets the needle. And it works very easily. I've used it with kids many times, trying to get them to iron consistently. Okay, so now I'm ironing to the... the straight piece that we did not Piece. I know that doesn't make any sense, but I will show you. And I've got the pattern, I will tell you which one I am letter wise iron it to. Okay, that would be D. So I iron my seam towards D. I tend to take the road less traveled. What does that mean? It means we've got so much, so many seams here that, and there's no seams on this side. It's a much flatter block if you iron it to the side that doesn't have all the seams. Doke. Now I can move this over and all we have is kind of like a nine patch. Now we've done all that small piecing. It's really not difficult. You just got to take it one step at a time. Okay. Yes, Linda, I am selling them in the store. And the pin cups too. Look at the bot, they're cute. And we got them in all different colors. Here's the cool thing, because we have so many snowbirds around here and you go to class or you have grandchildren, grandbabies that you don't want them touching anything that they can get hurt on. It's got a magnetic top. So you're traveling, you have little fingers around that you don't want it to touch. You can close it up just like that. Isn't it cool? I love it. I do a lot of chain piecing. Anything that will cut my time, I'm all for it. And it doesn't cut a ton, but when you add all those seconds here, there, and everywhere, in the day, you could save 30 minutes, an hour, 40 minutes. And in my day, time is money. And that's time that I can actually stick go home and relax and chill. Okay, so now we have our nine patch. So we're just gonna sew each row together and then sew all three rows um, together. I already figured out that this, these four fabrics are the same and that's what I'm ironing my seams to. That will automatically give me nesting seams where I need them when I put the rows together. Are you still with us, Linda? This is what I mean by chain pieces. I don't even stop and cut threads. Some machines, and again, I can't say for all, but I know from my experience working with Brothers and Baby Locks, which is one of the reasons why I fell in love with um, Bonnie Hunter, you need, you don't need, but it works. Your machine will work better if you have a leader. 
And what is a leader? That's this one right here. Before I put another fab, another um, set of fabric in to sew, it really does help. If you try without it, you can. Not saying you can't do it and you have to do it this way, but it really does help. Sometimes, or a lot of times, it tends to want to, um, when you first start, suck the fabric right into the plate. And I found by chain piecing and having leaders and enders, um, it really does help sewing. I'm not stopping cutting the thread. Hi, Linda. And trying to get the pieces through. I don't get jammed up as much. Okay. So I'm going to iron my seams to that one fabric that I told you about. And then I'll be ready to sew the other parts to it. Want a funny story, Linda? Some people know that um, my daddy has Alzheimer's. As a result, COVID has been very difficult on him. His routine is non existent. He's lost his routine. Well, I told my daddy that I was going to mow the lawn. It was a mistake. I love my daddy, but it was a mistake because my daddy loves to garden and he's not walking so well lately. And he asked if it was okay if he could mow the lawn. Well, do you ever see those people at the end of the runway for airplanes or when they're backing up and they're going, eh, this way? Well, that's what I did 10 times over the same patch of grass, trying to get him to come this way. No, no, daddy, you already did that. Nope, nope, you already did that. Just come this way. Yeah. Before he got tired and sat down. And then I mowed the rest of the lawn. But I did. I felt like I was just, all right, this way. Nope. nope, nope, nope. I'm, I swear I'm going to get lighted wands so that the next time. But that's what you do for the people you love. And of course, I told him he could mow the one anytime he wanted when I was there. See? Doesn't want to move because it's not liking it. I didn't have a leader on that. So I'm going to go just a little bit further. And I am by no means an expert in leaders and enders, but Bonnie has perfected the method. If you have a chance to watch some of her videos or her sewing, it's pretty amazing. I, I'm always struck by what some of these designers and companies have come up with. It's pretty crazy. And it makes a lot of sense. It really does. If you had, um, let's say you were doing a crazy quilt, or not a crazy quilt, a patch quilt, you could have a bunch of blocks already cut just the squares on the side. And like right now, hold on, I'm getting ready to stop. I could take one of those set of blocks, put them together, put it in just enough to get this part of my quilt that I'm actually working on out and be ready for the next part. And you just keep feeding those blocks in before and after you're actually doing your project. So then you're actually working on two projects at the same time. It's crazy, but I think it was amazing and a killer idea she came up with. All right, iron. And then we're just about done with this week's blocks. We just got to put the rows together.
and we're just going to put our rows together. So we're just going to nest the seams. I'm sorry, I took it away quickly, but you can see. There you go. All we got to do is do two more seams, and we are done for this week. This is probably the few places that I actually pin in this these blocks. And I definitely pin when I start putting the rows and rows together. I use a lot more pins then. Because every place, not just in between blocks, but every option. I know, Linda, and I felt so bad. Before COVID, I had bought him, brought in a, he's got a walker. And before COVID, I'm too old. I'm not that old, he says, to be using a walker. Well, lo and behold, being home and not going out much at all, other than doctor's appointments and very few instances if we go through the drive through um, he started using the walker all on his own. And now he's having a very difficult time walking because he doesn't do much. He's not as active. As much as I try to get him to get up and stretch and move around. He's, you know, just, he can only do so much. But he loves gardening. When he first came here to live with me, before his Alzheimer's got much, more, you know, before we even got him diagnosed, he uh, became my gardener and I fired my landscape because he actually loves mowing the lawn. I, I know it's hard to believe, but that was one of the things that he absolutely loves to do. He loves planting and he loves mowing the lawn. But literally, oh my goodness, he got about mm, maybe a four foot stretch of grass and length of my house, the front of my house, the sidewalk, so maybe, 12 feet. He must have gone over that one section oof, at least 10 times. So then he just sat in the walker and watched me finish mowing the rest of the lawn. And he was happy as a clam. Even doing that little bit. He was a very happy man afterwards. Tired, which was good, but it was a good tired. but he did enjoy himself. I think it makes him feel normal. And I can understand that. All right, we're just about done. Try and be careful. I mean, when you know you come into a scene, slow down, lift up your foot while your needle's down. I highly recommend when you're doing quilting like this to make sure you switch. A lot of the machines can be switched so the needle stops in a down position. Um, but that way you don't lose your place. Lift your foot. And so this is this quilt is a great opportunity for you to really, I don't want to say master, because as far as I'm concerned, there are no masters, but to master your seams and make the back of your blocks as neat as the front. The more you get comfortable and um, pay attention to that stuff, the better off you'll be later on when you're quilting. He did, Linda, he did. That's my daddy. Um, he doesn't like just sitting there. The only good thing about Alzheimer's and how bad it's gotten is he doesn't remember a lot. So I'm lucky there, but he hates being idle. Unfortunately, you see me? See how crazy I am around here and how much I work? Yeah, guess who I learned it from? My dad.
He is definitely not used to being sitting there and doing nothing. There we go. I know it's hard to tell. I'll bring it close up. Hold on. Maybe you can, yeah. There we go. There are the two blocks. It's not a lot to see when you're using this many neutrals, but it's going to look great in the finished quilt. I already have one over there all done, but I'm not rushing to quilt it because I want to have fun with it and I don't want to rush it. Anybody have any questions about this week's? If you do and you're watching this afterwards, just post your questions and I'll answer them. But that's it. I got to get my day and my butt in gear. Not that I haven't been working, but I'm getting ready to open the door in 15 minutes. So I got a few things I got to finish before then. Oh, look. Isn't it pretty? It's one of the blocks from our Saturday sampler. I'm almost ready to have the completed quilt done, or at least the top. But if I could just carve out, I don't know, eight hours to just do it, it would be done. But unfortunately, that's not in the cards. All right. I hope you guys have a lovely day and we will see you later. Bye.